It was around three years ago. I was 17 years old and I worked at the local library in my city. The library was located in the middle of the city but was totally abandoned in the evenings. I only worked in the evenings when all the older staff had already gone home. My colleague and I were the only one left there that night. As it was the day before Christmas and a blizzard was going on outside, not one single customer inhabited the building. My colleague Thomas was down at ground level while I was sitting at my desk on the top level. Normally, I would take the time to study, but it was the holidays and I was completely bored to death. The library was recently renovated, so I could look outside through the big windows that they had put up. I mostly looked at the blizzard going on, thinking about my bike ride home. It was a dark December evening and the snow was piling up. I just really wanted to go home. It's really snowy out there, Tom. What do you say we close up early? No one's going to show up anyway. Over. <laughs> Your jokes are funny. Over. Just ten minutes before we closed, I heard some people coming up the stairwells. It was some kind of family. One man and a woman with two girls. When they came through the door, I immediately saw that they weren't ordinary. The man had a pale, almost white face and wore red lipstick. The woman was also completely pale. They all wore clothing like they used to be in the 17 or 1800s. I just had my history exam, so I recognized it immediately. While I walked towards them, I saw that they were looking around as if they were lost. Can I help you folks? I asked them. They looked at me with big eyes, if I was talking Chinese. I almost thought about bailing, but as we just had a meeting about customer satisfaction, I asked again, a bit louder. Can I help you folks? They now all looked at me, with a big smile and large eyes. I was totally creeped out and I didn't really know what to do anymore. If I can help you, I'll be at my desk, I said, and I quickly walked away. When I was at my desk, I could still see the family just standing there, doing absolutely nothing. Uh, Tom, have you seen this family that just came in? Over. No, no one's come through the entrance. You good? Over. Now I was even more creeped out. When I looked up, I saw the man walking towards me. From the inside, I could almost cry, but I did my best not to show it. The man stood in front of me with his pale face and called out something in a language I couldn't understand. It sounded like English, but it sort of wasn't. I couldn't make out anything. I looked down at my computer to make it look like I was searching, hoping he would just take off. When I finally looked up, nobody was there. The whole floor was abandoned again. I did a quick sweep of the floor, but I found nobody. As if they just vanished. Just then, my colleague came up the stairs, and I told him what happened. He didn't believe me, and I thought I was trying to scare him. Luckily, there were security cameras in the library, so we could just watch what happened, right? After we closed the library, we went to the security office in the building and looked at the footage from earlier that evening. What I saw then was the creepiest thing ever. I was talking to nobody. The whole family wasn't on the screen. It was just me talking to myself. Looking for a new roommate is always a daunting task. Even though you interview and take the time to get to know that person, you don't truly find out who they are until you start living with them. I had begun searching for a roommate after I decided to leave my current residency. I was contacted a couple of hours after placing an ad on the Facebook marketplace. The message read, Hey Chris, I'll be moving out of my current apartment this August and I'm looking to room with someone new as my roommates are moving to California this year. I'm 27 and I'm currently going to school. When I'm not at school, I enjoy hiking and watching movies. I also apprentice at a taxidermy shop on the days I don't have class. Hope that's not weird. It's always been a fun hobby of mine. Anyway, I'm looking forward to hearing back from you. Have a great day, Lunaire. My first and most obvious reaction after reading the message was to check her profile. She was of medium height, had long, messy blonde hair and green eyes. In her profile picture, I saw her standing with a man and a woman shoulder to shoulder. They each adorned goofy grins and held up peace signs. 
Under the photo, the caption read, Love my roommates. I smiled to myself and decided to send her a message back. The sun beat down on us as we hoisted various objects to the second floor of our new apartment. It took us a couple days to get everything out of the moving trucks and into our new place, but as soon as we did, a wave of relief washed over our sweat-drenched and sore bodies. After a couple more hours of rearranging, we each grabbed a beer from the fridge and sat on the porch. We reminisced about old 90s cartoons and what video games we obsessed over as kids, and as the sun started to set, I truly felt relaxed and confident that things were going to work out. A week later, I started a new job for a construction company that was owned by a good friend of mine. As I was getting ready, I heard the front door swing open and walked into the living room to see Lunaire and her friend David sliding in a large box. What you got there? I asked. Through a strained grunt, she replied. I bought a freezer to store some of the animals I'm planning on using in my taxidermy work. I hope that's all right. I was obviously hesitant at first, as there was no mention of this happening in the first place, but I eventually accepted and returned to my room to continue getting ready for work. I came home at around 9pm after having a couple of beers with friends and noticed that the freezer was nestled snugly in the lower part of the pantry. A low hum could be heard reverberating off of the inner walls. I was curious to see what was inside, but didn't want to intrude on Lunaire's business so I went into my room and changed into more comfortable clothing. After changing, I came back out into the kitchen and started making a sandwich. I opened the fridge and grabbed what I needed. As I turned around, I stubbed my toe on the edge of the island countertop and let out a long, exasperated grunt. Through my frustration, I slammed the fridge door shut and checked my toe to see if there was any bleeding. As I raised my head back up, I was greeted by a shadowy figure. Lunaire was standing in the doorway leading to her room. The darkness behind her almost seemed to envelop her. Is everything okay? She said in a deadpan tone. Shit, yeah, I'm sorry. I just slammed my toe into the corner of the countertop as I was making a sandwich. I hope I didn't wake you. It's fine. She said in the same deflated tone as before. She then turned around and walked back into the darkness of her room. I could tell that she was pissed, so I quietly made my sandwich and retreated back to my room as well, only hearing the low hum from the freezer as I closed my door. I had the next day off so I was able to sleep in a little longer than usual. When I finally emerged from my room, I walked into the kitchen to make breakfast. As I opened the refrigerator, I noticed that the light wasn't turning on and there was a lack of cold air escaping from inside. I turned around and flipped the light switch to confirm my suspicion. Sure enough, the power was out. Damn it, I muttered under my breath. I walked over to Lunaire's room and knocked on her door to tell her about the power outage if she didn't already know, but there was no answer. I then remembered that she had classes that day and probably wasn't home. I walked back to the kitchen and passed the pantry. As I did, I slipped on the floor but was able to catch myself on the countertop. What the? I angrily exclaimed as I looked down at the floor trying to figure out what I had slipped on. It was blood, and it started to leak from the corner of the freezer and pool onto the floor. I quickly tried to open the freezer to find out the cause of the viscous liquid, but then I noticed that it had a padlock attached to it. I don't remember seeing that before. I ran out to my car and grabbed my toolbox from the back seat. I approached the freezer and set my tools down on the nearby countertop. I then pulled out a small pair of bolt cutters and snapped through the metal of the padlock. It fell to the ground with a large thud. I creaked open the top of the freezer and was greeted with a putrid stench that permeated my nostrils. I quickly pinched my nose and walked away gagging in response. I guess I should have realized that was going to happen. I muttered to myself in between gags. After gaining my composure, I grabbed some gloves from under the sink and started taking inventory. I could see a couple of dead birds and plastic bags wedged into the corners of the freezer. I took each bag out and set them in the trash can nearby. That's when I noticed that the blood was coming from the corner of the larger black bag. I don't know why, but I decided to open the top of the bag and peer inside. I was greeted by large, milky white eyes, a swollen black tongue surrounded by cracked and bloated lips, 
and the matted hair of a human head. I swiftly dropped the bag and fell backwards onto the floor. My breathing had ceased to exist and I grabbed the trash can next to me and expelled my disgust into it. I then ran out the door, got into my car, and called the police. As I sat in the interrogation room with a blanket over my shoulders, I couldn't help but think about the face I'd seen. It looked so familiar. That's when it finally hit me. I pulled out my phone and looked at Lunaire's profile picture. It was her old roommate. The one she said was moving to California. When the detective entered the room, she started the questioning process, asking me if I started noticing any weird behavioral occurrences around the apartment. Yeah, I stubbed my toe the other day and she creepily stood in the doorway. It seemed like she was pissed, but for some reason I had a strange feeling like she was concerned about something. That's when I connected the dots. She didn't come out into the kitchen because she heard me stub my toe. She came out into the kitchen because she thought I slammed the freezer instead of the fridge. A cold sweat started to form on my forehead as my surroundings became blurred. I could hear a low whine slowly starting to cover up the words of concern from the detective. As my vision started to clear, I could see another officer enter the room and whisper something into her ear as he handed her a piece of paper. Do you have somewhere you could stay at? She asked. I mean, I was planning on staying with my parents. They live about 30 minutes outside of town. Okay, she paused. Listen, I don't want to worry you, but we found this picture inside of your apartment. She slid the piece of paper across the table, and I immediately felt like someone kicked me in the chest. The head of Lunaire's other roommate sat on the chair. In the background, scrawled on the wall in blood, read... Love my roommates. All of them. Moonlight peered through my window as I jolted awake. My clamorous breaths disturbed the silence of my dark room. I had just come out of a frightful dream that had me thinking it was all too real. With sweat on my brow, I sat up and grabbed my water from the nightstand and took a sip from the now warmed glass. My hands shook as I recounted my nightmare of the horn-headed man. In my dream, I was walking through my neighborhood, the street lights flickering as I made my way down the uninhabited sidewalk. Nothing threatening, just a walk through the midnight hours. A block down, I could see a figure in the distance, walking slowly towards me. His steps seemed mismatched and labored. He passed a few houses looking straight ahead, neither looking left nor right. His head was fixed on the sidewalk in front of him. As I was getting closer to my home, I could see him slowly starting to embark on my territory. I quickly rushed to my front door and hurried inside. Through my window, I could see him walk past my property. I was thinking to myself, Oh God, please have him keep going, please. He was just about to walk all the way past my front yard when he stopped. His body almost shifted abnormally as he turned to face my home. He just stood there, looking, not moving, just standing there. The man bore the horned head of a skeletal goat. His body was pale and looked fragile, and his fingers were thin and bony. I thought to myself, what does he want? Slowly, he started lifting a quivering arm and pointed right at me. I started to backpedal into the darkness of my house, when all of a sudden he let out an inhuman screech. That's when I woke up. Too frightened to go back to bed, I turned on the television and saw that the local news for early risers was on. My stomach dropped and my body suddenly turned cold as I listened to the current news report. The news anchor on the television said, Breaking news, a woman who lived on Columbia Avenue has been murdered. 
Local officials say that they received an anonymous phone call from the victim's home. We arrived at the house at around 12.20, and we saw the victim inside in a card which rested next to her. The sheriff held up the card. On the back of it, I could see the image of the horn-headed man. The officer started to read. One down. Slowly, I go. He then lifted his head back up, and his blood started trickling from his eyes and mouth. I sat there shaking, and I couldn't breathe. Columbia's just three blocks away from me. I jumped out of my bed and ran to my window. Something within me made me want to look outside. That's when I saw him. He just stood there, looking, not moving, just looking. The horn-headed man, his body pale and fragile, and his fingers thin and bony. It was a late, moonless, snowy night. I heard the chilling cry of a bobcat as I arrived home from my parents' house, where we had just had Thanksgiving dinner in northern Michigan. Exhausted, I had finally made it to my bed when my pregnant girlfriend asked for nacho cheese munchies. Reluctantly, I laced up my boots and went to my car. Due to the cold, it took me a while to start the car, which only made me more irritated. But eventually I got it started, and I arrived at the convenience store to retrieve my girlfriend's mandated snacks. As I left the store, walking back towards my car, I saw a shadow of movement out of the corner of my eye. What looked like a person stood near the dumpster, just out of the light. I stepped towards the figure, and she looked at me with a giant sinister smile. Her face was so weathered, it looked like she had cracks all over her face. She was crouched down and appeared to be chewing on something. I looked to see what she was chewing on. To my surprise, it was a severed arm. It looked old, as if it had been rotting for weeks. I saw her glance at something in her pocket. I could see the outline of what looked like a pocket knife. As soon as I looked back up, she quickly charged me. I pushed her away and then ran back to the convenience store. I burst through the door and frantically yelled towards the cashier to call the police as I turned to lock it. He asked me, What's going on? I scowled at him and said, Please, just call the cops. I looked back outside and saw the woman had moved across the street and was still scrutinizing me as she maintained her malevolent grin. Look, there's a girl out there who's trying to kill me. Looking over me, he replied, I don't see anyone out there, sir. Those words shook me, even to this day. When the police reached the gas station, they began looking around for the woman while one of the officers asked me what had happened, and I told him the details of the encounter. One of the officers came back and said he couldn't find anything. I then took them back to where I first noticed her. We spent a few minutes intently searching, but there was no proof she was ever even there. The officer cocked his head and looked at me, as if I was deranged, and asked me in a judgmental tone, Are you feeling okay? I was about to defend myself, and then I started to think. I am tired, and I have had a couple of drinks, so I just told him, Yes sir, sorry for bothering you. I hope you have a nice night. And then I drove home. I got home at around 4 o'clock in the morning. My girlfriend greeted me with an angered but concerning tone of voice. She asked me, Where were you? Are you okay? So I told her everything that happened. Of course, she didn't believe me. I couldn't get to sleep that night. I sat in my bed questioning my sanity, wondering if it was all even real. Am I crazy? Maybe I'm just tired. But no, that can't be it. I, I saw it. But if I saw it, why was there no proof? Where did the arm go? Where did she go? Before I knew it, it was seven in the morning, 
and I had to go to work. I threw on my jacket as I was about to head to the construction site, and I put my hand in my pocket and noticed that there was a hole in it. It wasn't there the other day. I thought, what if she caught my jacket as I ran? Which further proves my suspicion that she was real. I couldn't believe it. My mind completely went wild until my girlfriend kissed me goodbye. I told my friends at work what had happened and they didn't believe me either. They made jokes about it the entire day, but I had my bowling tournament that day so that gave me something to look forward to. I got home and hung my vest and jacket up and rapidly put on my bowling shoes and got my bowling ball. My girlfriend looked at me with a pleasant smile and said, When will you be back? Probably around 11. <laughs> Don't be long. I won't. Don't worry. At around 10.30, the tournament had finally finished and we had won. I was so thrilled I had forgotten about the woman. As we were leaving, I noticed something at the other end of the parking lot. It was that psychotic woman. We stared at each other for what felt like an eternity. She slowly started moving towards me while waving her knife in the air and making cuts. I quickly jumped into my car and turned it on. As I looked up, I saw she was standing in front of me, staring at me. She slowly walked over to my window and she said in a quiet, deep, and scratchy voice, Little pig, little pig, let me in. I was frozen in fear, but I snapped back to reality when she banged on the roof of my car, screaming. I quickly slammed my foot on the accelerator and didn't let off it until I couldn't see her anymore. When I arrived home, I told my girlfriend what had happened. Like last time, she didn't believe me. I really thought I was insane, but I tried to forget about it and get some sleep. Later that night, I woke up and saw her in my room. All she said was let me in, over and over, as she got closer. She then started shouting, Let me in, let me in, let me in! Let me in! Come on, Paul, stop being difficult. Let me in! I was wondering how in the world my girlfriend hadn't heard this going on. The woman was right next to me and held up a knife to me. That's when I fainted. I woke startled in my room, dripping with sweat. Then I remembered I don't have a girlfriend, nor a house, or a family. Come on, Paul. Time for your morning meds. Let me in. I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> Everything okay, ma'am? people. It's a quiet neighborhood. Maybe I'm just exaggerating. Is there something I can help you with, sir? 
Come on, man. You're seriously freaking me out. Okay. Alright, I get it. No one calls me on my birthday, so this is, I guess, what you decided to do instead. Listen, guys, I've, I've played enough Silent Hill, okay? This is nothing. We're watching you. What the hell? You like to be seen. There's no one here. What? What's happening? You like to be seen. What the fuck are you people talking about? Please be a dream. Please, please be a dream. Hello? Is anyone... anyone here? not making this video for attention, or sympathy, or anything. I just want anyone who can help me to do that. My name's Daniel, and this is a story I wish I didn't have to tell. I've been a night owl my entire life. As a teen, I used to stay up way past midnight every night, watching terrifying videos on YouTube. I know now they were nothing compared to the horrors of the real world. Nothing compared to the tragedy my family and I went through. The story I'm going to tell to you now. My parents, being teachers, had always emphasized the importance of sleeping well to me and would definitely disapprove of my late night routine. So I knew that if they'd caught me up at that time, I'd be in big trouble. At first, this wasn't a problem. But after I told them about a child predator in our neighborhood that I'd seen in one of my videos, they seemed to grow more and more paranoid, which was obviously understandable. Every night, I'd hear one of them wandering into my room, checking on me, and every night, I'd immediately turn off my light and pretend to be asleep. I never knew for sure if it was my mom or dad coming in, since obviously if I opened my eyes to see, they'd know I was awake. Mostly, I presumed it was my dad, from the heavy-sounding footsteps, but either way, I found it pretty hypocritical for them to preach to me about being up late when they were awake themselves. Sometimes I wondered if they knew I wasn't sleeping, because often it was only after what seemed like hours before they'd finally leave and go to check on Alfie. That's my little brother and Lucy, my little sister. I'd have asked them about it, but I thought it would have confirmed any suspicions which they seemed to already have about my staying awake deep into the mornings of the next day. Like I said, I guess they were just paranoid about the child predator. It was stupid, stupid for me to presume any of these things, and I'll never forgive myself for it, but I did it all the same. 
Anyway, one day, Lucy's school, where my parents both work, announced a school trip. It meant they'd be gone at some point next month from Saturday morning to Sunday morning, and it meant that I'd finally get to watch the horror movie my friend had lent me, that my parents had refused to let me watch. There was one downside, though. I'd be left to look after Alfie. He, being only six years old, my mom was reluctant to leave him in my care alone, but my dad defended me, reminding her that Alfie had been up most of the night after a nightmare, so he'd probably sleep most of the day anyway. Besides, he reassured her, he's 17, he can be given a little responsibility. With a heavy heart, my mom agreed. I honestly wish she hadn't. Finally, the morning came for them to head off. It took longer than expected because my sister said some of her favorite toy dolls had been stolen, but eventually my mom persuaded her that they were probably just lost and told me to look for them whilst they were gone. I begrudgingly agreed, and soon they were ready to go. As they were leaving, my mom gave me a stern word, reminding me to lock the doors, not go to bed too late, and take good care of Alfie. She told me she'd be watching through the security cameras to make sure I was looking after him properly. I told her she really didn't have to worry. Then we said our goodbyes, and they were off. Alfie and I spent most of the day playing outside, but came in after the frisbee landed near a strange man who Alfie said had been in his nightmare. I told him that that was ridiculous, because even if he somehow was in his dream, he wouldn't be able to remember. Anyway, I went by myself to get it, and I have to admit that the man was fairly creepy. He had a huge grin, and his eyes, staring right at me, seemed to be permanently forced further open than they were designed to go. His clothes all seemed to have been made from someone 50 years younger, as they struggled to cling to his fully grown body. It was cold, but he was wearing a sun hat a tiny one for children, which barely fit on his head. I recognized it, but didn't know how at the time. If I'd learned anything from the videos I spent my nights watching, I'd have abandoned the frisbee and left, but clearly I didn't, because not wanting to feel like a baby, I approached him. As I got closer to the man, his smile disappeared, and he removed the hat and held it behind his back. I began to see his features in greater detail. He looked tired. He was pale and his eyes were bloodshot and had huge gaping bags under them. In the entire time it took me to get to him, the man didn't move an inch, other than the odd blink. Not even his eyes shifted. At this stage, I was getting uneasy. I just wanted to get it and leave. Hi, can I have my frisbee back, please? Thanks. The thought of that conversation, if you can even call it a conversation, still makes me shiver. I locked the front door as soon as we got home. We were both a bit shaken, and Alfie looked tired, so I gave him some more food and put him to bed. It took him about two hours to fall asleep. He kept complaining that he'd have another nightmare about that man. I told him he would but he wasn't convinced. I see him every night, he whispered to me. Well, if you see him again, don't worry, I'll be here to fight him off. This seemed to settle him down, and soon he was fast asleep. At about 11, it was time to put my film on. I couldn't have my mom knowing that I was watching it, so I did something naive and ignorant, and something I'll always regret. I turned off the security cameras. I watched it for two hours straight, my eyes never straying from the screen, until I replayed the last few seconds of the film, but the sound didn't happen again. It was coming from inside my house. Alfie? He didn't reply. But I could see him under the cover, so I thought he was just asleep, and I didn't want to wake him up. I swear, if I thought anything worse had happened, 
I'd have checked. You okay? I thought maybe I was just worrying too much, hearing things. It was late, and the film had been scary. Maybe it was just all in my head. I knew from the sound of his voice it was him. Alfie! Alfie? Usually this much noise would have woken him up. Alfie, what's going on? I knew something was wrong. It was him. The doll. I couldn't believe it. It had to be some kind of sick prank. It had to be. But it wasn't. It was the man I'd spoken to earlier. He'd taken my brother. Alfie! I was certain they'd be gone before I could reach them. But he didn't set off straight away. He watched as I tried helplessly to do something. I screamed and I shouted and I banged on the windows and I tried to open the doors. But nothing worked. It was all in vain. There was nothing I could do for my brother, my best friend, as he was stolen away from me. It was too late for the police to do anything. It was too late for anybody to do anything. He was gone, and in time, I'd have to come to accept that. You have nine new messages. First message. Hello? If you're out with Alfie, call me back when you get back in, please. Love you guys. Bye. End of message. Second message. Daniel, we've been trying to get a hold of you for hours. Is everything all right? Did you turn the security cameras off? They'll be fine. The security system probably just glitched out. Hey, Alfie, just call us as soon as you can, okay? know how mom worries. End of message. Third message. Listen, Daniel, we're starting to get really worried now. If you don't pick up, one of us is gonna have to come home to check if everything's okay. Please pick up. End of message. Fourth me Daniel, are you okay? Daniel! What's happened? Please answer! I couldn't bear to tell them anything. That was seven years ago. We never found him. When I asked my parents if they'd seen anything at all of this man whilst they checked on us during the night, they only looked at me, concerned and confused. What do you mean? They asked. I could only stare at them in horror. Every night, around two, you'd come and check on Alfie, Lucy, and me to see if we were sleeping. Daniel? They told me. No, no we, we didn't. didn't. The police wanted security camera footage of the man, but of course, there wasn't any. It automatically deletes any footage older than 24 hours, which meant I'd been mindless enough to stop it recording on the only night we could have seen him. You know, the strange thing is, I don't even know if I want Alfie to be alive. Because if he is, God knows what that monster has done to him. <sighs> Sorry if I've gone on too long, but the guilt's been killing me. I had to get it out somehow. I only tell it as a story because, well, people like stories, and I want as many people to hear this as possible. Alfie, if somehow you're watching, I love you, and I'm so, so sorry. Please, don't lose hope. And to the man who took you, it's not too late. If you have any heart at all, and even if you don't, Please, please let my little brother come home. To everybody else, if someone comes into your bedroom at night, open your eyes. You never know who it might be.
I still stay up late at night. But it's not because I don't want to sleep. It's because I can't. In case anyone sees Alfie, this is the last good photo we took of him. That's it. Stay safe. Thank you. My friend and I would go to this forest we found a few months ago. It was a 20 minute bike ride plus a mile walk to get where we used to camp. We made a teepee as our base and even sharpened a few sticks in case we had to fight anything. I know it's dumb, but we thought it was super cool at the time, being 14 years old. I'm a big fan of horror movies. I'd make my friend watch them with me all the time, and he hated it. He would always get paranoid that someone or something was going to get us when we were there. That's how we came up with the idea to make a teepee and wooden spears, so we wouldn't be attacked. We were finishing the school year online and had to study for finals, so we hadn't been back to the forest in weeks. After the finals were all said and done, we decided to take a trip up there to relax and check to see if our TP was still there. Our parents agreed to let us stay there on the basis that we'd keep in touch throughout the night. We didn't tell our parents this, but we would always take a big buck knife and a hatchet with us. We really thought we were manly. Anyway, when we were gathering our stuff for the night in the forest, we noticed that the buck knife was missing. We thought nothing of it and assumed we'd just left it at the forest the last time we were there. On the bike ride there, my friend was on edge. we just watched a scary movie and he was being a wimp as usual. At around 8pm we arrived at the rough part of the forest, where we had to continue the rest of the journey on foot. As we were walking, we smelled a terrible stench in the air. I couldn't locate or tell what it was. This, of course, made my friend think that there was a dead body and said we needed to leave right away. I told him that he was being a wimp and overreacting. The crunching of the fall leaves began to sound like squelching. As we peered down, we saw a trail of red leading up to where our teepee was. This really freaked my friend out. I told him I'd spotted a can of spray paint in the trash a mile back and that someone was probably playing a prank, just to calm him down. The closer we got to our base, the stronger the smell became. When we finally got there, we saw our teepee and felt a huge wave of relief come over us, even though the smell was as pungent as ever. We peeked inside the teepee through the little door flap we had made, and what we saw was haunting. There was evidence of someone living there. The clothes looked like men's, and they were huge. We continued to investigate the site. Behind the teepee was two rotting deer carcasses with a wooden spear in one and a buck knife in the eye of the other. At this point, my friend was already running back to our bikes, but I stupidly stayed for a little longer to scope out the area, when I was greeted by a deep, monstrous voice. Would you like to live with me forever? As I slowly turned around, I was confronted by a creepy old man. I couldn't even begin to describe his face. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen in my life. I bolted back to my friend. Luckily, he's a slow runner, so it was easy to catch up to him. We then biked back as fast as we could, not looking back. How long before we get there? We've been in it for 11 days. You know what I mean. The prison center? How long now? We'll get there when we do. What am I doing here? Hmm? What am I doing here? You shot someone. No, I know I've been told that. 
but why? Like I stated before, you've had your memory wiped for a reason. They don't want you to act on whatever motivated you to do that here. If I told you, I'd be next to get a sentence. How is that fair? I'm nobody anymore. Roland does not exist. I'm not her. Even if I was before, I'm not now. And I wouldn't shoot someone. I'm not a killer. And- You have the capacity to be. We've seen that. Everybody does. If I really did do what you said I did, I must have been in a position where anyone would have done the same. Any memories that weren't directly targeted, you should find come back over time, if that helps. Why? Ask one more question and I'll chain you to the back and make you walk! Good luck surviving the day. The day? They told me... I thought I had a life sentence. One day completes the life sentence of most people here. <laughs> That's not fair. I'm sorry. I'll leave you now. Make any attempt to cling on to the vehicle and you'll be killed on sight. Wait. What do I do now? You won't survive alone out here. The people in there might hurt you. They might not. But you won't survive alone. Or maybe you will. You'll have to make your own decisions now. This is a story about how I became a 30-year-old male who is secretly afraid to be outside after dark in cities. I live in Manchester, in the UK, and it's widely regarded as a relatively safe and multicultural city. Good transport, friendly locals, and plenty to do. I don't live there anymore, but I'm proud to be from there, and I will always have one hometown. This took place in 2016, and at the time I was working for a company that hired me to work on contracts. 
So four, six, sometimes even eight months abroad, and then two or three months at home. So when I was home, I made sure to see family and friends as much as possible, whether it be meeting and playing video games, a drink at the bar, playing sports, or traveling together. The incident took place when I was on my way home after a night out drinking, and I write this four years on since it happened. I still have PTSD from the incident, and think of this as my way of telling you all to be careful out there, as well as this being an opportunity for me to talk about it. Those who know Manchester know about its quite frankly amazing tram system. It's affordable and easy to understand. There is a tram station right near to my apartment, just outside the city center. I had been back in the country for seven days and had arranged to meet my friends in the city for a reunion of sorts, drinking, dancing, and catching up. You know how that goes. It's important to note at this point that, at the time, there was a homeless gentleman that adopted the tram stop near my apartment as his own. He would always sit at the top of the stairs leading down to the platform, and whenever I used the tram, I would always see him without fail. It had even gotten to the point where we exchanged a friendly nod to each other every time. But this time, on the way to the city to meet my friends, everything changed. On any normal occasion, he would be sitting under the shelter at the top of the stairs, either asking passers-by for money or just saying hello. But as I approached the top of the stairs, around 20 to 30 meters away, I saw him, and he stood up straight, almost too straight, with his chest out, just glaring right at me in the most menacing way. His brow was furrowed, his jaw was clenched, and he was breathing heavily. I could see his chest rising up and down with speed from now 20 meters away. Maybe drugs was involved or something had angered him. Why me? I thought. Now, I'm not the biggest guy in the world. I'm six foot and athletic, but I don't believe violence is the answer in any case. I'm not easily intimidated at all, but the way this guy looked at me sent shivers down my spine. I immediately looked down after we made eye contact and then looked ahead because I thought maybe it was just a glance from him. Then I looked back at him again when I was even closer and his eyes were still on me. This time they were wide and he looked unhinged like he was ready to attack. I looked away again because at this point I felt I had to ready and prepare myself for a potential confrontation with this guy. When I was close to him, I looked back again, and he took a step forward, watching my every move, looking me up and down as if he was assessing my weaknesses. As I approached the top of the staircase, he was turning his head as I moved. I knew that this was not normal behavior from him, or anyone for that matter. I thought I have to address this, because he's freaking me out, so I stopped, met his gaze and pointed my body towards him just before I went down the stairs. And I calmly asked him, is everything okay, mate? Can I help you with something? Nothing. I got absolutely nothing as he looked into my eyes. I could hear his fast breathing at this point through his nose and he looked like he was having some sort of episode. So I moved on and quickly went down the stairs. What the fuck has gotten into this guy? I thought. I almost felt bad for him. At the halfway point of the stairs, I looked behind me to see him standing at the top looking down, directly at me again. I could only describe the look he gave me as bone chilling. He looked like a predator that had found his prey. I kept moving as I didn't know if this guy had a weapon or what his intentions were at this point. When I got to the bottom of the stairs, I turned around again and to my shock, he had walked four to five steps down, still standing and glaring at me with the same disturbed and angered look. He was clearly stalking me now. I could feel my heartbeat in my ears and sweat was forming on my forehead and palms. Luckily for me, the platform was very busy and the tram I needed to catch was approaching, so I quickly immersed myself amongst the crowd of people getting onto the tram and found a seat. Wouldn't you know it, when I sat down and the tram started moving, I looked back towards the bottom of the staircase and there he was, 
just glaring at me with this horrific, sinister grin on his face. I did not feel safe. I felt targeted. His head moved and followed the tram, looking me in the eyes as we moved away. The entire journey to the city I felt on edge, anxious, and all I could do was think about that guy. When I eventually got there, my friends automatically picked up on the fact that I seemed a little off, so I told them about the situation I was just in, which they just dismissed, saying that I was probably just being paranoid and that he'll be gone by the time I get back home. I agreed with them, because I realized that he is usually only there during the daytime, so I enjoyed the night, we all drank, laughed, and even met some cute girls. Before I knew it, I was hammered, to the point where I had to look at my phone with one eye closed. My balance was off, and I felt like I could throw up at any second. It was around midnight and time to go home, so I said goodbye to my friends and arranged to meet the next weekend due to the success of this one. The last tram was approaching and I had to run drunk as a skunk to make it in time. I got onto the tram and when I got a seat and caught my breath, I remembered what happened at the tram station on the way back to the city. I felt sober suddenly, and I was honestly on the verge of an anxiety attack, until I remembered that I never usually see the guy late at night, which was comforting for the remainder of my journey. The tram arrived at my stop and I got off. I just stood there for a second, surveying my surroundings. The platform was empty. The skies were clear, although dark. The air was warm, and the only sounds were the nearby traffic and the tram leaving the platform. I remember it like it was yesterday. I looked towards the bottom of the staircase and the platform leading to the street, and I took a deep breath. I approached the stairs and looked towards the top. Much to my relief, he wasn't there. Stage one over. Stage two was easy, get to my building which was about 150 meters away from the stairs. As I slowly walked up the stairs trying to make as little noise as possible, my heart was in my throat. All I could think about was what I would do if he was there, but I was drunk and I didn't think fast enough. I arrived at the top and looked to my left and what do you know, he's there and as soon as I look at him his head snaps and he's looking me in the eyes with the same terrifying look, almost foaming at the mouth like he's won a prize. He stands up slowly and turns to face his body towards me. At this point, I realized how tall he was, about 6'2", huge gray and dirty beard, almost skinny with a lean body type. I was almost pissing myself, so to break the tension, I just nodded at him and told him, Good night, mate, and I walked on quickly towards my apartment. I suddenly heard a deep, hoarse voice say, You got any spare change? Loud and obnoxious, which I turned and replied quickly whilst I was walking backwards. No, mate, sorry. Have a good night, though, and walked on again. I was free, and my anxiety was disappearing. All I was thinking about was getting to my building as fast as possible. Then, I heard what felt like the loudest, most aggressive voice ever. Hey! I stopped, and I turned around so fast because he made me jump and scared me. He was holding a knife, and it was pointed directly towards me. The nightmare scenario was playing out now and I held my breath as he walked slowly towards me. I was definitely sober now, and I weighed up the options. I run and take a risk, or I start to negotiate with him. I thought, there is an ATM nearby, I can get some money and just go home. He was around five meters away, with the knife pointing towards me. I wasn't going to let myself die like this. He then said, I'm going to ask you again, do you have any spare change? I couldn't tell whether I wanted to throw up or cry, but I had to get out of this situation. No one else was around that I could see or hear, and it was on me to get out of this. I said to him, Look, there is an ATM. I couldn't even finish my sentence, because he had thrown the knife at my face. 
It hit me just above my eye, cutting me on my eyebrow, taking a chunk of skin clean off, and there was blood in my eye, partially blinding me, and there was blood all over my face almost immediately. I was blinded and breathless. I fell to one knee in shock and I barely saw the knife in front of me on the ground through my drunken, shocked, and partially blinded state. So I reached for it as fast as I could. But it was too late. He had already picked it up and tackled me to the ground. I yelled a guttural and deep shout for help down the street as he tackled me, holding the knife. A sound I didn't know I was capable of making, but the adrenaline was coursing through my veins now. He had the knife in his right hand and plunged it down towards my face, and the only thing I could do was put my hand in the way. I screamed in pain as the guy was on top of me. He had put the knife clean through my hand, in between the knuckles of my middle and index fingers to be specific. I started to push back, and realizing how much stronger I was than him. The tip of the blade was about five inches from my face, and then... A miracle happened. I heard the voices of a group of people yelling. Hey, stop! Accompanied with their fast running feet towards me on the tarmac, the guy's grip on the knife was weak suddenly, and he looked behind himself, clearly seeing the group approaching. They shouted again, yelling. Get off him! And he jumped off of me. Unfortunately for me, he took the knife with him and ripped it out of my hands as he jumped to his feet and swiftly ran into the nearby woods. There were five people in total who came to my rescue. Two of them initially chased the guy into the woods before I shouted, No, he has a knife! And hearing me say this, they let him go and started to call the police. This incident changed me for the better, and I wake up every day appreciating everything in my life. After the incident, I was rushed to the hospital and I had surgery to reattach the nerves in my hand two days later. The guy who attacked me is in prison now, for attempted murder. The police showed after the incident within five minutes, and full credit to them. They found the guy hiding in the woods, still holding the knife behind a tree, and they managed to subdue and arrest him on the spot. He was on a cocktail of drugs, and he openly admitted to the police that he fully intended to kill me if he had the opportunity. But this incident was simultaneously the best and worst thing that ever happened to me. The best, because I appreciate life so much more now. I talk to those I love every single day. All life is precious. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. And we are all mortal. Stay safe and alert, and do not waste a moment. As you don't know, who's going to be waiting around the corner. Thank you for sticking around to the end of the video. If you would like to support the channel, check out the merch link in the video description.